Sometimes the biggest obstacle keeping you from achieving your goals is yourself. Here to show you how to get out of your own way is triple board certified neuropsychologist and med circle educator, Dr. Judy. Your brain, your body, your mind, your soul. The world's working show with Kelly and Kaya. We all self sabotage to some degree. Let me know in the comment section below what area in your life do you find yourself self sabotaging the most? Your family, your career, your friends, your relationship. Dr. Judy. Hi. I feel like you have you don't self sabotage though. Well, we all <laughs> self sabotage sometimes. So, I definitely do sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And I think in the past I did it more like chronically with procrastination. Mm, got and it. And that actually I have a great personal story about that and like why that like snapped me into shape because sometimes you finally realize the consequences that it causes to your life and yeah. you say, "You know what? I'm going to stop doing that." But my whole point is self-sabotage is universal to some degree. And yes. that's why we shouldn't have any shame about it and we should talk about it and also talk about the solutions. Yes, and you, I have said this once before, but it so bears repeating. When I look at your life, it is the life I think I'll be living once I get all my stuff figured out. Ah. Like you wake up early, you go for a run, you eat right, you're successful, you have this great marriage. I met her husband, he actually is great. Like you have all these great things and talents and I'm over here going, man, I didn't have a Diet Coke today until 1 p.m. Like that's, that's awesome. my goal. No, nope. well, we all have goals like that too. I mean, but you know what? I think it's really important to recognize that self-sabotage is a process that is mm. tied into our biology and our evolutionary roots, which is why none of us can escape it to some degree. Yeah. And my whole theory about the fact that it is universal comes from the fact that there's only two primary drives of all human beings, and it is to attain rewards and to avoid threat. Mm -hmm. That's how we survive as individuals and as a species. And so usually when those two things are sort of in a complementary balance, everything's good. You're trying to go for your rewards, and sometimes you have to avoid the threat, make sure that you're doing okay. But every once in a while, the self-sabotage switch turns on if you start to avoid threat much more than thinking about attaining rewards. And in our modern day, threat is not the polar bear. It's not the saber tooth tiger. Threat is, what if I don't get that job? What if I get rejected when I ask this person out on a date? What if I go up for this public speaking thing and everyone laughs at me? Those emotional things can hold us back very similarly to the types of things that would attack us physically. Mm -hmm. And we have not developed to the point of distinguishing physical threat from emotional threat. Mm. So the fight or flight response gets triggered even when it's an emotional or psychological threat. And people sometimes start to avoid that more and more and then they stop thinking about attaining rewards and they fall off of their goal attainment. When I think of self-sabotage though, I think of the, the not the conscious self-sabotage. Yeah. Like I know this hamburger is bad for me, but I'm gonna eat it anyway. It's the things that we don't knowingly do mm -hmm. that keep us from having the life that we want. It's not going after, like if you see someone attractive, not going after it because you're afraid of the rejection. You're sabotaging a potential future great re relationship. Yeah, so while the switch itself is biological and evolutionary in nature, for each of us, the self-sabotage is often unconscious and it comes from a deeper place. Mm -hmm. And I have this self-assessment that really tells us about how we self-sabotage individually. And I believe that in my work and in my experience and the research that is out there for everybody to review that really there's four main factors that lead people to self-sabotage and they do operate sort of subconsciously until you call attention to them. And I made up an acronym to remember this and the acronym is LIFE. So LIFE. LIFE, L-I-F-E. So L stands for low or shaky self-concept. I stands for internalized beliefs. F stands for fear of the unknown, and E stands for excessive need for control. So some individuals are gonna have one of those four, some people might have all four of those, but either way, I believe that those four things cover the spectrum of how people and why people self-sabotage eventually. So can we go through each of those one by one so we're really understanding what they encompass? The first one is L yes. for, uh, what is Low it? Low self-concept or right. shaky self-concept. Okay. So self-concept is who we believe we are in the world. Mm -hmm. And there's kind of a holistic self-concept, how you feel about yourself in general, but then there's also sort of these various segments to your self-concept and self-esteem. So you may have very high academic self-esteem, mm -hmm. but maybe lower athletic self-esteem, or you may 
may have really high athletic self-esteem, but lower social and romantic self-esteem. And so whatever area in which you find that your self-concept is more shaky, that tends to be the area in which self-sabotage is more likely to occur because you may believe that you don't deserve good things to happen to you, or maybe you're not good enough. And those types of things can turn into self-fulfilling prophecies. That makes sense. If this is resonating for you watching this, hit that thumbs up button or leave a comment below because my hunch is, is that this is resonating for everybody. Even for high, high achievers like yourself, yeah. there are still areas of our lives where we go, why are we not better? Why are we yeah. not happier, more fulfilled here? Exactly. Yeah. And I think that that's what people really do when they start to assess and notice, wow, there's certain areas in my life that could be better. And yeah. I want to sort of state this up front that most of the times people feel pretty good about 80 to 90% of their life. Mm. But it's really that 10 to 20% where, man, why can't I get to my goal here? Like, yeah. why do I keep tripping up? Yeah yet I can do all of this stuff in this area of my life. So yeah. maybe my work life is awesome, maybe my friendship life is awesome, but like the dating life is just not coming together. Right, Why? Right. Or my work life is awesome, my dating life is awesome, but man, I just cannot get my health into better shape. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. There's always like one or two areas where you see yourself getting stuck. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to figure out is like how do we unstick you so that you can move on and achieve those goals and live the life that you wanted to live. Yeah. Un get unstuck so your life doesn't suck. Okay, yeah, what's, uh, like that. That, there's, there's my little <laughs> tidbit. What's, uh, all right, I. I, I is internalized beliefs. So these are the beliefs that you learned from childhood. And those beliefs are really prominent because when we first come into the world, it's the first time that we're learning about anything. We're right. learning about who we are in the world, how people respond to us, whether we're loved, what people think of us, our personality traits. All of these things happen early childhood. And in early childhood, because it's your first exposure to these things, you remember them so much more. Our human, brain, our human brains have this propensity to actually integrate new information into our existing schema. So, mm. you know, once we've established a certain belief system, when new information comes in, you're not going to say, hey, maybe my existing belief system doesn't make sense anymore. No, you're going to say, yeah, there's a way to twist that and make it make sense in my existing system. And so something that can really apply is when you watch your parents or other important adults and see how they navigate problems. Yes. And if they present as a little bit anxious, oh my gosh, you definitely can't go out there because you can't trust anyone. Well, when you learn that lesson as a child, as an adult, you might actually adopt that for yourself and you start to ta take on those same beliefs. And then that colors how you interact with your goals, with other people in your life and how you go through life in general. Makes sense. All right, what about F? F is fear of the unknown or mm. change. Human beings in general are not great with change overall because change is tough. Change means that you are not the master of your universe for at least a brief moment. And for all human beings to survive and feel good about themselves, they need to feel like they're in control yeah. and they want to know what's coming up. And so there's certain personality traits though that lead you to be more uncomfortable with change. And if you're uncomfortable with change or the unknown, it's harder for you to reach to higher levels of goals because there's gonna be a period of time in which you're not exactly sure what's gonna happen. And so these types of people tend to sort of confine themselves to the familiar and they kind of get stuck in sort of more of like a ho-hum pattern rather than really push themselves to get past that discomfort so that they can live a better and more fulfilling life. Got it, all right, and we round it out with E. E is excessive need for control. So this is for my high achieving people, people who might is describe this you? themselves as type are A. You, are you E? I'm totally an oh. E. <laughs> A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, I, I say this with the most love when I say type yeah. A because I, I self-identify as a type A okay. and my husband is a type A also. So you can imagine yeah. the two of us, like we can butt heads over very small things. Yeah. Um, but type A people, they love control. And sometimes when you're on your way to goal attainment, there's going to be an aspect of it that you can't control right. and that makes them uncomfortable and that makes them not want to reach for their goals. And it's yeah. very easy to see that that can happen in a variety of different things when you're element is excessive need for control because the minute somebody says, well, you're not going to be able to control this part of the process and you're going to say, ah, oh, forget it. I'm going to maybe go another way, yeah. but maybe you should have like stuck the course and just dealt with that discomfort. Yes. Well, it's all great advice, but what do we do with all this information and how do you know where you fall on the L I F E acronym? Well, Dr. Judy Ho at drjudyho.com has a quiz that you can take when we come back after this short break, I'm going to share my results and Dr. Dr. Judy is going to tell me how I can stop self-sabotaging parts of my life. But right now, check out this Med Circle educational series with Dr. Judy. 
I think once that awareness is there, it's the great time to implement any small steps that you can to curb the behavior that you think is a problem. So if you notice, hey, I'm not feeling so good, I reach for that drink, or it's become a habit that the minute I'm off the clock, the first thing I do is pour myself a drink. Once you recognize that pattern, you break it by substituting a replacement behavior. So this would be something to do instead of what you were doing before. So instead of reaching for a drink, what can you do instead? Usually it's helpful to do something that would prevent you from also having a drink at the same time. So turning on the TV doesn't really count because then you can watch the TV while you pour yourself a drink. Something that actually keeps you busy and hopefully provides some kind of positive stimulus, positive experience. And so some people have picked up some hobbies. You know, when, when I want to pour that drink instead of that, I'm gonna go work on this project that I started. You know, mm -hmm. maybe they started an arts and crafts project. Maybe they started knitting. Maybe they're just gonna go organize some of their books. But anything that could keep their hands busy so they don't engage in the same exact behavior. And anytime you have that urge, just do the replacement behavior instead. Yeah, uh, a recovered alcoholic I was talking to said that at 501 every day when he was drinking he started drinking mm -hmm. 501 started drinking yes so when he was recovering one of his coping mechanisms was that at five o'clock he was in the gym mm -hmm. so that way exactly. that's his new behavior that's his substitute behavior absolutely and i think that works out really well because then you're teaching your brain to adopt a new pattern mm -hmm. and before you know it it becomes so natural you don't even have to think that way you don't have to say oh i want to have a drink i'm going to the gym you just go to the gym Triple board certified neuropsychologist Dr. Judy Ho has authored this book, Stop Self Sabotage. It's something all of us could use and something we all need to be more aware of so that we can take action. And inside that book and at drjudyho.com, you can take a quiz to determine where in your life or what component of yourself uh, could use a little work. So I took your quiz. Yes. Okay. And I have, uh, so we're broken up into four sections, mm -hmm. low shaky self-concept, internalized traditions, fear of change or the unknown, excessive need for control. What do you think I, I scored the highest on? And in, in theory, you want to score low. I scored high on one. Just one, okay. Well, two I scored high on. Okay, I'm going to guess lower shaky self-concept yep. and then internalized beliefs. I scored a four out of five for low shaky self-concept. So really high on that one. I, I, I scored zero for internalized traditions. Oh, yeah. Awesome. And then I scored three on excessive need for control, which oh, okay. I thought I'd be more around a five on the excessive <laughs> need for control, but look, look, I'm not as needy as I thought. Good job. Okay. So this low shaky self-concept, I was very surprised at those because I thought if you would have asked me outside of the quiz, do you know who you are? Mm -hmm. I would say, I think at this point in my life, I'm the closest to knowing my true self. Mm -hmm. My scores indicate otherwise. Yeah, and I think that sometimes if you think about compartmentalizing your self-concept, which a lot of people really have these different roles and domains of life that they consider their self in, maybe it's just a couple of areas where you feel like maybe I'm still not quite figured out just yet. Mm -hmm. I tend to second guess myself a little bit more in this arena. and. It doesn't mean that, oh, I just have horrible self-esteem all the time. It just means that in a certain area of life, you might question yourself a little bit more. It might just be a little shaky, meaning like you think you have a pretty good idea, but then if you get like an outside uh, reaction from somebody, it makes you second guess like, wait, maybe I'm not quite as well developed here or wow, what do they think of me if that happened? You know, yes. it just makes you question it more as opposed to it coming from a more internalized and stable place where you're like, ah, even though they're giving me this reaction, I still feel very, very good about exactly where I am in this particular area of my life. Yeah, the, one of the first questions was, it was true or false question. You said, the way you feel about yourself on a given day mm -hmm. depends largely on situational factors. Examples, what others say to you, mm -hmm. how others respond to you, or what your weight is on the scale. Mm -hmm. and, and I said true for that. Yeah. I, I think if, if you left here today and said, Kyle, it's so good seeing you, I'm gonna feel better. If yeah. you left here and said, this is the last time I ever want to see you. Yeah. I would feel really bad. Yeah. I'm very much affected yeah. by people's, I guess, perception 
and opinions of me, which yeah. I didn't think I was really, but yeah. I, I think I am now that I really analyze it. Well, and I think that that also contributes to somebody who is really good at being attuned to other people and like looking for observations of social interactions. Like there's really good things that are associated with that, but when done a little bit too much, it can lead you to question yourself more than you really need to. Because mm. when somebody responds in a certain way, you take responsibility automatically. Mm -hmm. Sort of like, wait, did I do something wrong mm -hmm. to cause them to feel this way or to cause them to act this way? Instead of, for example, maybe they're just in a bad mood and has nothing to do with me that you're more likely to maybe think well what did I do in this situation so yeah. certainly that to me that's a better way to live life than somebody who always thinks that they have no responsibility whatsoever sure. and they don't think that they are ever at fault but as you can see if it's taken more to the extreme then your mood and the way that you feel about yourself can be more variable throughout the day and that can be kind of distressing because when you don't feel great about yourself you're more likely to be impulsive you're more likely to maybe do something to escape a distressful feeling, things that might not be the healthiest for you, maybe eat junk food. I mean, everybody's a presentation is different once mm -hmm. they recognize that link. But in general, if you're not feeling amazing about yourself, you're more likely to do things that are also maybe not honoring sort of this idea of like, if I am care about myself, love myself, I'm going to take more energy into my self-care, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. But if I'm not feeling great, then eh, screw self-care today. I'm not going to take care of myself. So that can sometimes happen if it goes to the extreme. Do you find that most people are weighted heavier on either L, I, F, or E? So I really find that there's a spread and I find that for some people, certain combinations are more likely to occur together. Oftentimes L and I do occur together because mm. sometimes a lower shaky self concept comes from messages from childhood. Yes. I find that the fear of the unknown and excessive need for control sometimes go together too because again, if you have an excessive need for control, part of that is possibly that you don't like the unknown. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to control every element of your life. Yeah. But I also sometimes find just a spattering. Some people will say that they're all four and some people will say, well, I'm I and then I'm E. So like there's no like full on pattern, although I do find that L and I tend to co-occur for a lot of people. and. F and E turn to co-occur for a lot of people. So I'm sure everyone's going to watch this. Go to drjudyho.com so they can see where they can improve. But how do people really interpret these results? So they, they let's say they scored five out of five for mm -hmm. any one of the pillars. Um, and so now they know that this is an area of their life that they could improve upon, but then how do they go about actually improving it? Yeah, so once you find out what underlying driver is responsible for your self-sabotage, mm -hmm. so is it L-I-F-E or is it all of the above, then we start with the actual prescription. How do we actually fix the problem? And it all starts with your thoughts because thoughts precede every emotion and every action, even if you're not aware of them. Most of the times we're not aware of our thoughts. We're mm -hmm. just aware of the negative emotion that's occurring, like we don't like the emotion, or we do something that we later regret. We're like, oh, why do we do that? But we don't think about the fact that there was a thought that preceded all of that. And it's that interpretation of whatever event or whatever stressor or whatever was going on in your life that led you to feel those feelings and to act in those ways. So one example that I give is, you know, two people can have the same thing happen to them and have very different responses to it. So two people can be laid off on the same day and person one is panicking. They have a thought, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do for money? How will I deal with my family? and immediately their emotional responses are distress, anger, sadness, and then that may lead them to isolate, seclude themselves, maybe do something unhealthy to try to escape those negative emotions. Person two has a thought, oh, well that's disappointing, but I actually didn't like this job very much anyway, and maybe this is my time to kind of explore what else is out there. Immediately that emotional response is totally different. Mm -hmm. Maybe a small sense of relief, maybe a little sadness, but also maybe a feeling of excitement. Yeah. And then maybe that person will actually start planning a little vacation, maybe look into different job opportunities. So you can see that they can totally diverge in terms of their emotional and behavioral responses, even though it's the same event. So what's different? It's their thought process. Yes. So we need to tune into our thoughts. We have over 50,000 thoughts in a day. Whoa. That's the average for an average person. Wow. So if you're an overthinker, it might be more than that but our brains can't process all of it. It would be crazy to process all of it. So your brain starts to ignore things that have happened over and over again. So any kind of like negative thoughts about yourself, internalized beliefs, fears about the unknown, maybe your tendencies for control, those things have occurred so many times that your brain is just like, eh, it's not new information, so it's not paying attention to it, but yet it still affects your emotions 
and your behaviors. And so mm -hmm. the first thing is to like really look at those thoughts, identify the ones that are contributing to your self-sabotage, and then come up with a plan to change those behaviors and tolerate the distressing emotions that come with it. And all of that is in your book, Stop Self-Sabotage. Yes, it's a six-step plan that's based in evidence supporters. That challenges. is what I need. You gotta give me plans, you gotta give me steps. Yeah. I need, hold my hand and tell me everything's gonna be okay. <laughs> I need that actionable list of things to do. And so I cannot wait to dive into this book. Um, I have the benefit of knowing you. We've worked together plenty on Med Circle, mm -hmm. and I have learned so much from you. So I know that this is just more of what's in here, and yeah. what's in here is already so good for you, not mine. <laughs> I, need, I need more of what you have. Uh, and so I think this is going to really give people that roadmap they need to get rid of those blocks they may yes. or may not know they even have. Yes, that's exactly right. For me, it's all about concrete solutions because mm -hmm. this idea of self-sabotage, people even use that terminology. They'll mm -hmm. say, ah, I self-sabotage my diet. And then it's like they don't do anything about it. So my goal was to destigmatize it. Yeah. It's universal. It's yeah. biologically and evolutionary rooted. So let's all get over it. Yeah. We all do it sometimes. But if it becomes a chronic pattern for you, how can we fix it? Well, it's all about taking a deeper dive into what your thoughts are consisting of and then making a concrete plan to re-engage the part of you that feels excited to achieve that goal yes. again. Really hone your motivation and really change your thinking and your action yes. so that you can finally live the life that you wanted to live. You hear that? <laughs> live the life you wanted to live. All good stuff. Dr. Judy and I did my all-time favorite series at Med Circle on acceptance and commitment therapy. You talk about actionable advice and insight into your life that you didn't even know you wanted. It's in that series. We're gonna give you a sneak peek of that right now. There's also a self as context. And what that means is there's sort of like a continual you, it decreases your need to attach mm. to a certain moment in time, a certain thought, a certain feeling, a certain experience, a certain hardship. It's not you. Mm. It's not actually you. But most of us get really inundated with the selfish content, mm -hmm. that moment of suffering. Oh my gosh, this will never end. This is horrible. But you know what? It's at some point in time, you weren't suffering with this. And at some point in the future, you will not be suffering with this either. And this is actually just a discrete moment in time, whereas the you as context is always there. It's always safe. And actually that's the you that can engage in this willingness work without being so afraid. Because yeah. you realize that there's this intact version of yourself yeah. that has seen you through all your ups and downs, all yeah. your happy and terrible moments, and it is still there. Oh my God. I, I truly feel my brain changing when you're saying that. It's, it's so fun. Because I'm love this so... Idea. I'm becoming an observer of my life in such a new way. It makes it a little easier for you to do some of the work that we've discussed, like willingness. Yes. Because willingness is hard when you're focused on the pain of the moment. I, I should be willing, I should accept this, but I don't want to, it's so painful. Yeah. Why don't I just go and pick up a bottle of alcohol and drink a little bit and right. go to sleep and not remember that it's there, mm -hmm. right? That's just more tempting right now. Mm -hmm. But if you have self as context and you remember that this painful emotion or this painful experience is just a discreet self as content moment mm -hmm. and that it'll pass like mm -hmm. every other painful moment in your life has passed. Mm -hmm. And the next time you remember yourself as context, you could be in a completely different mode. Yeah. And that that is a permanent thing that's always there for you, yeah. it makes the willingness work slightly easier. Yeah. Just knowing that the part of you as self as context has survived everything. You can watch that series and more when you go to medcircle.com. Now, Dr. Judy, you have a laundry list of accomplishments and you also find time to give back and do a bazillion media appearances and write a book and all these things. <laughs> what is working for Dr. Judy? Well, I think a lot of it is really about 
orienting myself to my values every day. That's mm. really important to me because we are such a goal-driven society and goals are important, but only if they are rooted in your values. They are connected to the things that are the most important to you. So values are not things you can check off of a list. You can do that for goals, but for values, they're things that are basically your direction in life. It's the things that you want your life to stand for. Like when you go, what do you want to be remembered for? Mm. And it's really about digging deep to find out what is most important to you. Like what, what do you really want want to do on a daily basis that makes you feel good about yourself on the inside. Mm -hmm. So people have all kinds of different values. They can be things like honesty, adventure, um, attaining wisdom, having community, spirituality, just to name a few. There's thousands of different values. But in my book, I list 33 of the most common values. And if you're not sure what your values are, you can do an exercise, which is also available on my website free of charge, called the values card sort. So you can sort of play a little game of solitaire with yourself, but with these values cards, mm -hmm. and you order them in the order of importance from most important value to least important. And then I would take the top five cards, your top five values, and ask yourself, when was the last time I nurtured each of these values? And when you really think about your life that way, it really changes your approach to life. And I start with a reflection every single morning, even if it's just two or okay, three now, minutes. Hold on. Do you really? I do. Because you know how every people come morning. on TV and they're like, yeah, you know, it's just about yeah. balance and blah, blah. And we know, I know, girl, you're just saying that because you're on TV. Yeah. You, li you start every morning with a reflection. Yeah. And I don't remember when that started, but it's been at least two years where, and you want to anchor that reflection period with something that always happens every morning. So it could be with your morning coffee or like the minute you wake up, you like, just turn from your bed and you grab your journal or whatever your reflection activity is. And people sometimes think, oh, reflection, ew. But with your personality, you can think about the one that works best for you. For some people, it is journaling. For some people, it's reading like a page or two in a self-improvement mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. For some people, it's reading an inspirational quote or two and thinking about that. For other people, it's reflecting on their values and mm -hmm. thinking, okay, what are my top three values that I wanna do something about today? Today, it's community. Okay, well, what can I do for community? And it doesn't have to be something huge. If, you're, if your value is community, it's not like organize a fundraising event, mm. but it could just be call my mom, yeah. you know? Because that's yeah. community, right? So we just wanna that. be at a place where we can start to do that on a daily basis because then the rest of your day will just flow. Yeah. And then whenever you run into a challenge, you just remember, what did I wanna stand for? Yeah. And then it'll reorient you on the right path and help your decision making be an easier process. Yeah, and if too. something doesn't end up in your favor, you were still committed to your values. Exactly. And that's gotta make you feel good. Well, it's so huge because when you think about values, if you really wanna cherish a value, it's not always an easy road. Yeah. Like if your value is honesty, Oof. sometimes you're gonna feel pretty bad about approaching that one. Yes. But if you know that it's important to you, then you do it anyway, despite the distress. And that's what's really important about the values-based work. Top two values. Top two values, spirituality and community for me, at least today. All right. A couple days ago, it was spirituality and health. You know, I mean, yeah. it really just depends. Sometimes you have a rotating list of values. You kind of, there's some that make an appearance in the top five all the time, yeah. but then they might be differently ordered depending on what's going on in your life, which is yes. why it's always good to take a daily assessment or at least a weekly assessment of what they are. Yeah, honesty and transparency for me. I know those are kind of similar, but I need to do the value card sword on your website. I wanna hear from you guys, what is your value, your number one? And of course it can change, but right now as you're watching this, what is number one for you? I'd be fascinated to know. Thank you, Dr. Judy, for being here. So much wisdom. Aww. I just gotta keep sitting down to soak it all up because Thank you have you so much to give. Thank you for having me. This yes. is super fun and Callie seems like her values are. Rest, rest play, relaxation. food, <laughs> friends, you know. <laughs> Callie's gotta figure it out. We gotta be more like her. That's right. Thanks for watching, I'm Kyle Kittleson and remember whatever you're going through, you got this.